Oh, how the mighty can fall, and how often lies or broken promises are the cause. Supposedly nationalist party One Nation recently announced Lebanese Muslim Emma Eros as candidate for the New South Wales seat of Hornsby, and it has not gone down well. A large number of former One Nation supporters have let the party know exactly how they feel about the move. New recruit, former ALP leader Mark Latham, made a long-winded post defending the move and attacking critics as far-right and Moasist. This didn't go down well either, with most comments remaining highly critical of the move. Someone should tell Latham that insulting voters isn't a way to win them over. In fact, it's a surefire way to make them vote for somebody else. The question remains, where did this betrayal come from? And why is Pauline backing down on her previous promises? To answer that, we need to go all the way back to 1996 and the speech that made her famous. Before we continue, for some amazing karma, please check out Subscribestar, where for as little as $5 a month, you can support my work and help save Western civilization. I and most Australians want our immigration policy, policy radically reviewed and that of multiculturalism abolished. Yeah, yeah. I believe we are in danger of being swamped by Asians. Between 1984 and 1995, 40% of all migrants into this country were of Asian origin. They have their own culture and religion, form ghettos and do not assimilate. When she gave this speech, the mainstream media and establishment political parties decried her as Moasist and resoundingly condemned her. Despite this, she won the support of a large number of Australians for her courage and willingness to speak the truth. In 1998, One Nation released their Immigration, Population and Social Cohesion Policy and the party won 11 seats in the Queensland State Parliament the same year. They held principles such as Principle 6. Australians, like other peoples of the world, have the right to maintain their unique identity and culture. Principle 7. Our migrant intake will be non-discriminatory on condition that the numbers do not significantly alter the ethnic and cultural makeup of the country. And Principle 8, English is the official language of Australia and government policy will encourage widespread use of English within all communities and in all the institutions of the land. While some of the principles arguably didn't go far enough to save our country from globalism, it was a step in the right direction. It was so effective that some even claimed John Howard adopted her policies on immigration, but this is just a popular myth. In reality, he ramped up legal immigration and thus sped up our ethnic replacement. Kevin Rudd later accelerated this even further. In 2001, One Nation radically watered down many of their immigration policies, stating that Australia can be enriched when languages other than English are spoken and that immigration policies should not be racially based. One Nation went on to lose all but three of their Queensland state parliamentary seats. Despite showing weakness and essentially capitulating to the establishment, her challenge to the ruling class was so great that they jailed her on trumped up fraud charges. Such is the risk of standing up against the traitorous establishment. She was, by objective accounts, a hero to the nationalist cause for a time. By standing up for an ethnically homogenous nation, she stood up for the interests of her people and her country. Yet, she made the worst mistake any nationalist can make. She capitulated to the left. All seemed lost for the champion of nationalism. That is, until 2016, when she once again won a seat in federal parliament, this time taking a profoundly anti-Islam stance. We face a new challenge because over the past 40 years or so, large numbers of settlers have come from Islamic countries where equality between the sexes is not accepted and where religion and government are co-mingled. We know that Islamic countries are organised very differently and that people from these countries hold different beliefs on equality between the sexes, homosexuality, and the role of religion in society. 
This is a historic moment. By bringing this matter into the parliament, my party is throwing open the debate on banning or, at the very least, greatly reducing migration of such people to Australia. It seemed Pauline was back and willing to fight for Australian values. She even made a fantastic little troll by entering parliament in a full burqa, a move that was also widely condemned by the usual suspects. But then came the bad boy senator himself, Fraser Anning, who outright called for an end to non-European migration in his maiden speech albeit via a plebiscite. Rather than stick up for him, Hanson decried his speech as being straight out of the Goebbels handbook and offensive, and thus attacked a man she once called her friend. Likely realising that this might annoy her base just a little bit, she put a new motion to the Senate. Anyone who pays attention to the news or spends any time on social media has to acknowledge that there has been a rise in anti-white racism and a rise in attacks on the very ideals of Western civilisation. I would also hope the Senate does the right thing and acknowledges it is indeed okay to be white. Such a simple sentence should go without saying, but I suspect many members in this place would struggle to say it. People have a right to be proud of their cultural background, whether they are black, white or brindle. If we cannot agree on this, I think it's safe to say any white racism is well and truly rife in our society. As is expected in the current climate of anti-whiteness, the Senate rejected the motion with the Coalition even apologising for accidentally supporting it. The motion was again widely condemned by the ruling class and their mainstream propaganda arm. The mainstream media produced articles such as The Sinister Origin of It's OK To Be White which is funny because if you know the meme you also know its reactions like that which prove the creators right. This was indeed a very successful publicity stunt and got the nation talking, but it was just that, a publicity stunt. Something to piss off the left and get Normie's attention while signalling to her base that she is still on their side. Enter Mark Latham, a man famous for losing elections and leaving political parties, who became the leader of One Nation's New South Wales branch. Soon after, One Nation announced their candidate for the seat of Hornsby, Emma Eros, a Muslim woman. In doing so, the party once again flew directly in the face of its core constituents. In response to legitimate criticisms of hypocrisy, Latham gave us the following, and I quote, Not only has Emma abided by the rule of law in our country, she has worked very hard to make a success of her life. She's a licensed plumber, a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, and a very good mother and wife. She works hard every day for herself and her family, rather than sitting on Facebook peddling hatred and fake rumours. The Lunar Right nutters on Facebook have a wild conspiracy theory about Islam that all Muslims, especially the moderate ones, are trying to trick us. When the caliphate is called, someone like Emma Eras will, redacted, substitute betray us. How crazy can these people be? Have they ever met a Muslim? Have they ever studied the diversity of the religion, whereby its different sects and factions fight each other? Australia is a wonderful country, and a land of tolerance and opportunity, but some wastists remain unfortunately a very small element. When they call public meetings, the mainstream media turn up, but only a dozen other people. They have no mainstream public political support. Essentially, he's told everyone to go stuff themselves, and if you don't like it, you are clearly a wasist. To him, I give this response. History is quite clear on the matter. Whenever Muslims are a minority in a country, they demand tolerance and the right to practice their own religion. But when they become the majority, they demand submission to their faith, often, in fact, in most cases, by force. They demand all non-Muslims either convert, die or pay the jizya, which is a tax on non-Muslims. This is a current and historical fact. Miss Eros is no doubt a lovely woman. She's attractive and as a small business owner, she is clearly a hard worker. 
I also don't doubt her desire to reform her own religion and commend her on her efforts. However, if One Nation are going to claim to support Australian values, this candidate is just not the way to do that, no matter how well-meaning. If she wants to reform her religion, she should do so by working within her own community to reform it, and by convincing her fellow Muslims to follow a different path. The very best thing she could do would be to convert to Christianity and to call for her fellow followers of the Quran to do the same. The issue isn't Emma Eros as an individual, it's the soul of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party and who they represent. They burst onto the Australian political scene as a truly nationalist party demanding the ethnic makeup of our nation remain predominantly white. A few short years later, they reverse this policy, moving towards what I'm sure some would call the centre, and they lost all influence. The universe gave Hanson a second chance to take a stand for something meaningful, and again she capitulates, only this time there is real competition. The truth is, Hanson has a history of backing away from meaningful policies that represent our people, and she is not the messiah. Fraser Anning's Conservative National Party promises to defend Australia's ethnic majority and openly wants to keep Australia white as the founders intended. This represents a genuine choice for Australian nationalists, not to mention the wider community, as this party goes directly against the objectives of the ruling class. It is indeed a spanner in the works, so to speak. How this plays out at the next election is yet to be seen. But according to the news poll, One Nation's vote has dropped to its lowest level in a long time. This could be within the margin of error, but it's not a good sign either way. People are crying out for a genuine alternative, and people are sick of liars and broken promises. Regardless of the next election's outcome, with the prospect of a socialist government just around the corner, and as Australia's housing Ponzi continues to implode, the demand for a genuine alternative will only grow. If it's not One Nation or Fraser Anning this time, it will be someone else next time, and the establishment with assorted brainwashed leftist followers will be wishing for the days of the bad boy senator. I hope you enjoyed the video, share the truth around, and I'll see ya when I see ya.